So we're going to conclude the day um, with a lecture from Professor David Mattingly, um, who will talk to us um, about some of the themes from today and and um, reflect on 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 those and the way forward. Well, uh, yeah, I'm another one who kind of got into this week and suddenly started to notice the deadline for doing this talk <laughs> and, 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 and panic. And I, I, my, my mental picture of this was it was some concluding comments. And then I noticed they'd slipped in this word keynote, which made me really <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um, uh, panic about it all. Um, we are here to celebrate. Britannia to celebrate the last 50 years of, of, of Roman archaeology in Britain, but we're also here to reflect on it. And after reflecting quite uh, quite a lot of the last few days, I thought whilst uh, coming here to praise Caesar, I'm also going to uh, offer some critical commentary as well, as indeed a number of other uh, uh, papers have done today. In part, you know, and, and it's stimulated very much by the sort of contributions we've had today. Uh, you know, seeing the potential that we have in our subject, you know, new source of evidence, new approaches, new methodologies, um, new theoretical frameworks that allow us to do different things with the vast amount of data, wonderful data, that's been assembled o o o over the, well, more than 50 years, but in, in particular reflecting on, on the last 50 years. Um, I'm not going to try and do a summing up that kind of addresses what each paper has said, because I would just spend all my time uh, summarising what we've already heard, and I don't think that's particularly useful. Um, but I hope that you'll see echoes of many of the other contributions in some of the things I'm going to say. I'm going to uh, focus in part on the journal and the potential of the journal, um, but I'm also going to comment on aspects of the state of Romano British studies. And, uh, I have to say, if I refer to some of my own work in, in, in framing that uh, sense of uh, a, state, a state of the subject, uh, please excuse that self-indulgence, uh, but I hope it will become clear. It's, it's also because I think um, that the work that I've done over the last uh, 20 years, in part, it has, it's, been, uh, it's echoing broader developments mm -hmm. in the subject and the work of many people in this room, in fact, um, that have opened up something of a, 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 of a divide, an intellectual divide, between where Britannia started as a journal and the agenda of study, and where the subject is going to some extent uh, today, and particularly perhaps in the universities, but I know uh, there are many people here from professional units and, and others who are also interested in, in these new approaches. So, <coughs> start with the journal. I think the first thing to say about Britannia is, you know, it was set up to be a journal of record of the best, but also the most traditional time, the place uh, we would go to to find out uh, key information, um, the latest discoveries in the field. And, you know, I haven't been a, a member of the Rome Society quite as long as Martin Miller, but I do have uh, this enormous range of, uh, of of copies of the journal on my shelf, many of them are extremely well uh, thumbed, and I certainly quarried the journal uh, phenomenally when I was writing um, my, 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 my books on, on Roman Britain. It's an amazing legacy. I mean, you know, I, I think many of us who've been in Roman archaeology can probably remember when we first encountered Britannia and that sense of <coughs> new information. Coming out, and that palpable excitement one had as one unwrapped a new edition and flicked through for uh, lo looking for stuff that one was vaguely aware of, or just to look through what was new. Um, and I think you know that is something that uh, I, I certainly will always carry with me. As a, you know, Britannia was one of the first journals I engaged with in that way, and I always remember that that, that, that experience. So, if I have some critical comments to make about, about uh, Romano British studies and indeed you know, the, the sort of direction of the journal, um, you know, I, I do that with constructive intent. How can we make 
Britannia even better, and how can we make it even more fitted for the developing uh, world of digital online publishing, uh, which is the way that journals are headed. And also, I think in you know, all subjects, healthy disciplines evolve and change. And I think if, if we weren't expecting our discipline to change and evolve, um, then, it would be, then it would be a, a pretty sad story. So the mission statement of, of Britannia reminds us that um, you know, it, it was created at a particular moment and for a particular reason. Um, it was created by that group of, of leading Romanovich specialists in the 1960s, at a particular moment in time, they were mainly men, it has to be said, we've heard something about uh, their sort of intellectual dominance in the, in, in the field at the time. Um, but in some ways, Romanovich studies wasn't a particularly self-confident discipline um, in, the, in the 1960s. My ex-PhD supervisor, Barry Jones, uh, several times told me the story of how, uh, you know, amongst the, uh, the, the, the sort of Roman historians and classical world people at Oxford, uh, those who were interested in Romano uh, British studies were completely looked down upon. And one of the, the classics professors famously described Roman Britain as, hmm, two wet bricks in a wet field. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in a sense, building a journal that would establish the, the academic, uh, you know, uh, rigor and the academic credentials of the subject was really important in, in the 1960s. And a, and a journal with an agenda of study uh, behind it. And I think you know, that in part uh, explains some of, some of the, the energy that, that, that was put into the early development of, of Britannia. We've noted this, this point about the kindred studies and um, you know, we'll have a little bit more to say on that uh, later on. It's clear pets are part of kindred studies uh, after several of today's uh, pres presentations, perhaps. Um, but the, you know, the intent was there to do something that went beyond Roman Britain, but I think it was also clear from Heller's presentation, from Martin's presentation, a number of others, that uh, actually the journal hasn't as much stepped across into those parallel fields, whether other time periods or looking beyond uh, the British Isles, as we might have hoped. And I think one of the problems that Romanovich archaeology faced in the 1960s was to counter that perception of the two wet bricks <coughs> was the need to build up a really solid body of knowledge. And so an awful lot of energy has gone into wall building, you know, blocks of knowledge being put into the wall. And Martin reminded us of those amazing corporate <coughs> of inscriptions and mosaics and sculpture and so on, that have been built up and are the foundational works uh, of, of the subject. But there has been a danger, I think, at times, that the subject has become very descriptively focused on building those blocks into the wall. Um, and perhaps not always uh, taking the time to reflect on what the data may mean or where they, where they may, uh, may lead us. Um, and this, you know, in a sense, takes us slightly towards the sort of more stamp-collecting area of, of Roman archaeology. And, you know, we have titles, um, you know, along the lines of a new Roman fort in, you know, lower mud wallow or somewhere, or, you know, a, a, a Roman altar, um, you know, from Stony Blockstead or something. I mean, you know, we, we know those types of articles. They're important. They're part of the Journal of Record Function of Britannia, but they don't always take us very far beyond the, the presentation of the material. And I think that's you know, one of the crucial things um, that, that we need to be addressing. And I think you know, another aspect of, of this mission statement is, um, in a way, it's quite a, a, a reactive mission statement. It's waiting for people to bring stuff in. To, to do that reporting, um, rather than proactively seeking, seeking to um, new avenues of, of, of research. And it partly reflects the fact it was set up by a group of people who knew what they wanted, they knew what they wanted to study, and they were going to go on and do it. So, do I turn 
to the pages of Britannia as eagerly today as I did when I was, you know, kind of, um, 20 years old. Well, yeah, I, I would have to say I don't have quite the same excitement, or quite the same time, perhaps even, to look at it. Um, my bookshelves are absolutely groaning under the weight of those volumes, and it is uh, it is quite daunting to to get uh, to get to the same level of, of detail. In fact, you know, most of us nowadays probably are doing much more online um, than within the hard copy journals. Uh, my brain struggles to keep up with the accumulation of data. You know, we have built up one of the most extraordinary uh, data records of any Roman province uh, in, uh, uh, in the Roman Empire. <coughs> but it's quite hard, I think, now, it's becoming increasingly hard for us actually to, uh, to manipulate and work with that data to think about what it means. So, the standing of the journal you know, is both a blessing and a curse because you know, the traditional focus, the traditional shape of the journal does encourage a certain type of reporting of discovery and reporting of material. Um, and it also, I think, you know, in a sense, slightly discourages um, submissions from people who are trying to uh, engage with more theoretical approaches or, or, or new approaches because they're not uh, always so sure how, how things fit. And in the meantime, over the 1990s particularly, we've seen the rise of, uh, of, of, of different intellectual approaches um, within Roman archaeology, and particularly the rise of the tract generation. Um, and again, their interests and their, uh, and their agendas aren't always, um, haven't always been so well reflected uh, within the covers of Britannia. We can see the editorial committee, and it's very visible in the editorials written over the last 20 years, the editorial committee is regularly discussing how do we get more, uh, you know, uh, more people to write thematic articles, interpretive overviews, um, but the journal is quite unyielding in a way to, uh, to, to, to transforming itself by its, by its very nature. And I think, you know, another aspect of those editorials Increasingly over recent years has been you know, the, uh, the, necro the necrology notes by the successive editors on those founding fathers of Britannia. Uh, and those people you know, have cast very long shadows uh, on, on the subject and the way it's, it's been studied. But I also think you know, many of those uh, stalwarts of Romanovich archaeology in the 1960s, they would recognize a lot of the landscape of study as they created and fashioned it in the 1960s, late 1960s, still reflected in some of the structures, some of the, uh, the, the sort of core interests of the journal today. Well, why should Britannia be changing today? Why should Roman studies uh, be changing? And uh, you know, uh, we've heard a little bit about post-colonial approaches already today. Um, you know, again, Britannia is being created right in, in the late 60s at a time uh, when you know, the modern British Empire is coming towards its end, but it's a pretty slow uh, dying away of the light of the British Empire, as you can see from some of the dates uh, on the slide here. Um, and I think whilst there has been considerable revision and review of modern empire, under the influence of post-colonial studies, uh, we, and not just in Britain, but scholarship worldwide, have been very slow to, um, to, to exert the same sort of uh, uh, post-colonial scrutiny to uh, the Roman Empire. There's a strange uh, nostalgia, really, uh, for the Roman Empire that um, has, has inhibited the development of a mainstream post-colonial discourse for a long time. So, wh why should we study the Roman Empire in the post-colonial world? Well, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, post-colonial studies has been invented. Uh, it's been directed to the study of imperial systems. Why would we not use post-colonial study to, uh, to, to uh, shed some light uh, on, you know, one of the greatest empires that uh, has ever existed in, in world history. It, it is you know, quite a self-evident move 
that we should uh, that we should uh, be making. So there have been, as we've seen today, I think, you know, some significant shifts in Roman archaeology. But at the same time, I don't think we've seen quite as much uh, engagement with these uh, post-colonial ways of looking at empires and thinking about empires as we might expect, uh, given the, say, the, the parallel development in historical studies directed at modern European empires. Um, the TRAC conference certainly uh, took us, um, I think it's taken us quite a long way along this route, um, and you know a lot of that built from uh, Richard Rees's uh, famous book, infamous book, and of course Martin's uh, um, you know, masterwork uh, of 1990, which set a whole lot of us uh, on, on, on the road to looking at and thinking about the Roman Empire in post-colonial ways. Okay, this is excursus. I did my end of number crunching uh, on, on Britannia. So I, I, I did the lazy one, which is simply go on Britannia online, do some word searches, which I think is just searching on titles, possibly abstracts as well, is my, my guess. And it sort of gives us a sort of, again, a, another way of looking at you know, the recurrent themes in, in the contents of, of Britannia. So, yes, that dominance of kind of Roman military stuff, I think, is very evident. Uh, in here, you know, a, an imbalanced uh, amount of concentration really uh, on military archaeology, perhaps. Um, towns, obviously, uh, are, uh, are fairly key. Villas, roads, temples, the kind of fine arts uh, of the province, um, inscriptions, and a whole, a whole range of uh, sort of key uh, material culture. Um, Move on a little bit more. I tried a few kind of, you know, just looking at one of our kindred areas. So, you know, one roundhouse reference, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then some, you know, names of key sites actually that, you know, that have been in in the headlines relating to that sort of Iron Age Roman interface. Um, and um, you know, again, these are say relating to articles or or book reviews or. Um, abstracts, yes. Again, it's not surprising to find lots of emperors and a far out number of the British rulers who get, uh, who, who get sort of highlighted in here, but that's even the humble centurions seem to outrank the, uh, the, those British leaders. Uh, yes, and yes, that gender bias is even uh, visible there too. <laughs> and a final one, theory produced 13 hits. Um, and of course, on the top of the list, um, <laughs> Candy Garden <laughs> and Cosmos. So that's some unusual other candidates who have thrown up from this. Um, but I think it's really interesting. I mean, Heller showed that, that graph, uh, that diagram that showed that, and this article looking at theories of imperialism in Britannia is the most downloaded. It's almost twice, two to one outnumbers the next most popular download. Um, and that certainly does suggest that there is an audience and an appetite in the readership of Britannia for those more theoretical approaches. And indeed, you know, lots of the other titles on Heller's list um, are also uh, things that are strongly theoretical, all presenting large thematic overviews, exactly the sort of thing that I'm um, saying. You know, yes, it exists in Britannia, but I'd love to see more of it um, in any given issue. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the personal journey that I've taken uh, into kind of theoretical and post-colonial uh, approaches. You know, I started out as a fairly traditional Romanist. I was very interested in Hadrian's War, first dig at Vendelanda, um, you know, very interested in Roman frontiers and forts and all that sort of stuff uh, when I was a young, a young man. And then, you know, gradually I had this sort of kind of awakening of, of, of interest in post-colonial approaches, in part... Um, you know, I think came about through working in North Africa, an area which uh, where the, the reaction of the local people to the Roman period was very different um, to the sort of reaction that we tend to have in, in Britain. Again, another result of my um, 
web searching was this interesting fact that none of these three books, which I think are, you know, were kind of interesting uh, discussion points in the development of at least my thinking, have actually registered on the readership of, of Britannia within the, within the journal. Okay, out of this, you know, I mean, you know, I, I'm going to talk about one or two sort of holy cows that I think, you know, we really do need to sort of um, take out and shoot uh, now. So, Romanization, I'm not going to go through all the arguments about why we should do away uh, with Romanization, but that has been, you know, become one of the key things coming out of my, uh, out of my work and the work of many others as well, I think, from the more theoretical view. Um, Yeah. Um, the other book there, Roman Britain, um, you know, I, I, and it, it's uh, I, I'm on record in my uh, in my imperial possession as saying that you know that there is a problem with this shorthand. It leads us to thinking about uh, the subject in, in, in quite a particular way, and it's convenient. It's a nice short shorthand uh, to use. But Roman Britain is a strange place. Um, how to define Roman Britain? Well, I think, you know, in a way, the maps of Roman Britain are a very good uh, starting point in, in, in how they indicate this. So if we just look at what's on the key in the maps, it is about the Roman bits of the landscape, the most Roman bits uh, of, of the landscape. And the same is true, I think, in, in sort of, if we think about the academic agendas, in thinking about Roman Britain, it's prioritising those more Roman bits of the landscape. Um, okay, now now they show um, all those uh, modern sites as well on the landscape, which are to much uh, less effect. Um, but what we glean from the Ordnance Survey map is uh, is this vision of of you know, different types of Roman sites, towns, forts, temples, villas, and so on. Um, interestingly, you know, they show very diverse distributions, uh, and that might prompt some questions about what's going on under that. But as Neil's uh, talk reminded us earlier, you know, two of the most important projects of recent years, focusing on rural settlement, have started to produce very different sorts of ways of mapping um, the, the, the rural landscapes. So, you know, that middle map is, if you like, the, 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 the Roman Britain map of rural settlement, focused on villas. Um, but what the uh, the map in that top left corner reminds us is that, you know, there's a there's a world of sites beyond, beyond the villas. And both in uh, Jeremy Taylor's work and in the Royal, uh, uh, Roman Royal Settlement Project work, um, you know, the resilience of many of the, uh, the classic Iron Age forms of, uh, of, of settlement, enclosed settlements, roundhouse and so on, continue alongside more Roman elements. And these are maps that show Britain in the Roman Empire as opposed to Roman Britain. I think, there, you know, I would say there's a really different things that we uh, should, should be recognising more explicitly. So in the imperial possession, I, you know, these were some of the, the, the key themes that I, I, I tried to develop. The rejection of a simplistic Romanisation model, its replacement uh, with exploration of ideas of discrepant identities, and we've heard about discrepancy uh, in Ellen's paper as well, and, uh, you know, show, and she shows very clearly, I think, the really subtle ways that artifact studies can start to exploit these sorts of models. Um, regionality, again, uh, something uh, that Neil raised very strongly coming out of the work, the detailed work on rural settlement. Um, and far too often in the past, we've, we've focused on you know, just showing the commonalities um, of, 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 of sites in, in Britain rather than ex exploring just how different one side is from the next, or one region is from the next. And the book, again, it, it's not a conventional historical narrative, it was much more about how power operated in a frontier province, and what the consequences of that were for different groups of the population. Not everyone experienced that imperial rule in quite the same way. And I say, uh, you know, I think I try to enforce uh, a distinction between what we might understand by Britain and the Roman Empire and Roman Britain. And I think, you know, if we go back to that 
uh, Britannia and you know, Romano British and Kindred studies, that's about Britain and the Roman Empire, it should be about Britain and the Roman Empire, perhaps too often we've been moving towards a focus on Roman Britain. So Britain as an imperial and heavily militarised territory, I mean there are implications for the experience of people uh, within the province. Um, you know, my vision of Britain and the Roman Empire is not to everyone's taste. Uh, some of the reviews were, uh, the journals that did choose to review it were, <laughs> were, were pretty blunt about this, that uh, you know, I, they thought I focused too much on the negative aspects of Roman rule, but uh, you know, 350 years of military occupation, I think, is, is likely to have uh, a, a certain amount of impact uh, on, on a region like Britain. And Ian's headless Britain, I mean, reminds us of the, of the sharp end of those sorts of uh, violent relations of, of empire. But I think the challenge really is to explore the deeper meaning of all the amazing data that Romano British studies has, has accumulated. And you know, attempt to show how the new ideas and approaches of the track generation can be applied to grand historical overviews. Okay, finally then, last two slides. Some ideas for future Britannia and some discussion points arising around this. Um, digital journals clearly open up lots of new possibilities. Um, and as I've said already, it's very clear that the editorial committee for Britannia spent a lot of time discussing these issues and are trying to uh, elicit more articles of a, t of a particular type and to change the shape of, uh, of the journal to some extent. But it's like stealing a super tanker or turning around uh, a super tanker. It, 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 it's a long term pro. Uh, process. So, no, no, a lot of what I'm saying is, is repeating arguments that have been uh, well, uh, well rehearsed in their meetings. And I'm not saying that we're going to turn this super tank around and sail off in a completely different direction. It's, it's, I, I think you know, that may be the wrong analogy. It's more about what we can add, what we can, you know, what, how we can um, grow the, the, that, that coverage particularly. You know, we need more um, we want more coverage of the kindred studies. Uh, we need uh, more coverage, more engagement with the wider Roman Empire. Um, you know, we need more science in there. We need more women in the journal. We need more diversity, really, uh, reflected in the journal. A digital delivery you know, has many advantages now. Um, there are lots of neat things we can do with the digital formats and deliveries. Um, the first law of publication online is a great development. We'd have to wait. Um, perhaps that's why I don't have such anticipation when the journal comes. I've already read some of the key articles uh, by the time it, it does. Um, we get greater visibility. We increase our readership base, potentially. Um, we've got that potential for supplementary materials and images to be put on the website. And you know, perhaps a key issue is the potential to reduce the really huge costs of traditional journal, hard copy publication and, and distribution. So here's a, a suggestion to end with. Why not split Britannia into two distinct annual outputs to reflect the different functions and agendas? How about a Britannia reports issue that essentially includes all that wonderful Roman Britain in 2000 and whatever, um, the book reviews, articles and short contributions that are essentially descriptive, reporting on field work, and we might conceive of that part of the journal as becoming entirely on online, allowing more material, more colour illustration and so on. And then a separate Britannia discussions issue that explicitly invites theoretical pieces, thematic overview, discussion articles uh, of different scales. And we could theme some annual issues as well in the, in the way that Gallia does, for instance, with dedicated volumes. Um, well, again, you know, using that world archaeology model of advertising in advance the future themes, that's a way to make sure there's plenty of time to get material in that's fit to the, uh, the, the, the theme, to make sure that the proper level of peer review can be gone through the selection of material. Um, anyway, I leave you with those thoughts. <laughs>
What is going to be the effect of Brexit on the development of a lot of British studies? Um, well, nothing good, um, <laughs> but I think, you know, and I think uh, it's been mentioned a couple of times today, this is not the time for us to be more parochial, this is a time for us to be much more engaged with, uh, with, with broader scholarship on the Roman Empire, outside, you know, beyond, beyond the channel. So it's a good moment for us, actually, to kind of open up the journal a bit more. Surely that means getting beyond Europe. And? <laughs> well, looking at North Africa, perhaps, which is outside Europe. Well, why not? Yeah. You know, if, if, if what we learn but in North sure Africa is something to inform our, mm. our, our approaches in Britain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I ask who you think the readers are of Britannia? What do you expect them to wish from the journal? How far the content of the journal is influenced by, for example, university syllabuses or a wider readership which may be represented here? Well, I think that, you know, this conference is a great example of the mixed readership and indeed the mixed authors authorship uh, for the journal. You know, we have university people, we have postgraduates from universities, we have a lot of people who work in professional and commercial archaeology here. Um, we have lots of the general public enthusiasts uh, who engage with it. And I think there are different, you know, people engage with Roman British archaeology in different ways. And there are some people who undoubtedly will continue to be more interested in that journal of record aspect of, you know, let's, let's make sure that, that the information on this my local area is well represented in the of the journal. I think that's a really important function, and you know, as I say, I'm not proposing any shift away from that. And I, you know, I think we're all fascinated to read about new discoveries in our local areas. Um, but I think there is also, you know, in in university circles, and indeed, I think amongst the, you know, the most intellectually engaged um, professional archaeologists working in the units. Um, again, a number of people in this room contributed really important studies that are great thematic overviews, uh, and we want more of that. We want people not just to be reporting, but to be thinking beyond the, the individual report to the bigger issues that these things raise. And I think, in the end, that makes the subject more interesting, because at the end of the day, you know, how many Roman villas do you need to see till you understand more or less how a Roman villa works? But if we approach villas with new, new methods, new questions, and we start looking at the lives of the live within them and the varied lives of the people in the countryside around them, then we start to create something, uh, you know, a deeper and richer picture. And I think the idea of themed volumes, I mean, that's something Becky mentioned as well about, you know, a, a volume that's perhaps more about, you know, has an emphasis on a theme like uh, yeah. bioarchaeology or <coughs> it could be environmental archaeology yeah. or it could be, you know, a more theory or something. I think that's quite nice. Um, you know, that doesn't exclude any of the other things, but it's just something that we could relatively easily potentially do. Um, and, you know, inviting contributions the way that world archaeology does, I think that's important. Um, can I, can I, can sorry, I, the, the mic, sorry. Sorry. Um, Cross-reference that very interesting question about who is the readership. And I just, um, I do wonder whether if we're thinking about 50 years of Britannia, actually looking doing some proper work on who is reading it, who is using it, what they are uh, trying to get from it, might be quite a useful contribution. Yeah. Was, it, <laughs> was it the University of Arizona that had a number of downloads? Yeah, but yeah. well, that, I mean, I think we would need to do a survey of the people who are reading the hard copy as well, because the downloads, obviously, that tends to be universities. And CUP did say, I think, Fiona, was that right? That CUP says some of those downloads, or Lynn was telling me, some of them are also automated yeah. things that the universities do, so it skews your, mm -hmm. skews your data. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, fascinating conclusions. Um, just a sort of thought. 
I like your suggestion resort to think about Britain in the Roman Empire much more. And I wonder, is this a time to actually bring the Journal of Roman Studies and Britannia back together? I mean, we've heard very little about the Journal of Roman <laughs> Studies. <laughs> or is that just too heretical a suggestion? <laughs> um, well, there's a whole other debate about, you know, where the Journal of Roman Studies should be going, for instance. But, uh, you know, I think probably not uh, in, in terms of joining up with Britannia. I think Britannia has gone its, uh, its separate path and is going further away um, from, from the Journal of Roman Studies. <coughs> Uh, I think there may be a risk in the idea of thematic volumes if by that you mean a continuous sequence of them. Uh, I can imagine that when many people get their issue of Britannia there are a number of papers that they jump to read and there are others that perhaps they will never read in each volume. But with a sequence of thematic volumes there may be a whole series of such volumes that a lot of people would not read at all. You you need to mix things, I think, for your position. But I think, you know, what I would say is, I think my suggestion that we, we keep the Journal of Record essentially as a separate issue. Lots of people read that above all, um, but we have a discussion volume, and, it, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have a themed volume every year, or, you know, maybe, you know, th there's always the possibility that we go down to more than one issue uh, in, in a year. You know, um, you know and it's, it's one of the virtues of, of online publishing that things can appear more quickly. And one of the problems with uh, old style Britannia and JRS is, you know, things are submitted so far in advance of when they actually appear. And often they're accepted and, you know, um, gone through the proofing, and then they have to wait for that sort of November publication. Uh, moment, sometimes a year ahead uh, from when they've been fully accepted, and it's a long delay. And I think online journals give us the chance to get things out a lot more quickly and in a more targeted way. Bear in mind that not everybody goes online. <laughs> but I think you know, that, you know, that whatever whatever we decide in the Roman Society about our journals, the way the international publishing market is moving, um, you know, I think hard copy journals a limited lifespan now. Um, Hello. Uh, just a comment. I note that uh, in your Britannia reports you talk of Roman Britain in 2000 and something. After your comments uh, about um, your dislike for the concept of Romanization and Roman Britain, how come you're talking about Roman Britain? But I'm just using the conventional wording from the journal as it stands at the moment, because of those sections on site discoveries, on inscriptions, on, on the Fort of Antiquities are labelled in that way. Uh, you also talked about Romanized at one point as well. <laughs> it is a very difficult word to avoid. Um, but maybe it's like, uh, I don't think it's a help in France that they call it, uh, um, uh, let me see, uh, what do I mean, Gallo Romain. Because even though they are putting the Gallic first, in fact, I think this is more to do with the tensions over who to identify with. Well, is it Vercingetorix or was it Caesar? <laughs> Rather than anything realistic in terms of really trying to do something different from what uh, we do in Britain. Just a comment. Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of back up, I guess, a couple of points that were being made there about sort of speed and timing, that it seems that agility has to be kind of a key plank of whatever is done with Britannia going forward, um, and uh, in terms of making it both allowing for more topical stuff, uh, and, you know, World Archaeology is published four times a year, so they can get over some of that issue of 
people not being interested in some themes and there's scope for a more general issue. Um, and I, um, is the Theoretical Roman Archaeology Journal going to be multi-issue? Uh, more than one uh, issue per year? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess you know the model we have has served us very well for 50 years. But if if there is any time to think about a fairly radical rethink, then perhaps now is it. And it obviously has significant implications for who does what in in the editorial of the journal. But uh, I mean, one advantage if you split it into two reports and discussions, or whatever they might be called, is that they needn't come out at the same time of the year. So that work can be spread in terms of you know getting getting the Yep. Thank you. I just absolutely support what David has been saying in terms of splitting the journal up into two, two sections. Uh, I think in this modern digital world, uh, we do need to react more quickly, but also I think we very often under, under appreciate and forget just what an enormous appetite there is out there for information, new information coming out of Roman Britain. And some of the things that have been found in Britain this year have quite frankly reached millions of people. And it's how that information is transferred to millions of people. And one of the great things about the journal as it stands at the moment is its authenticity um, through the editorial process. And if you can encapsulate that, that, that element and then include it into a, a more uh, rapid way to reach out to people, then I think you're onto a really good winning formula. Thank you. Yeah, on that happy note, <laughs> I think what we wanted to do is just end the day by thanking all the speakers again, um, and also thanking Bim and um, Fiona, obviously, for organising, um, thanking the Roman Society for sponsoring the event, um, both the editorial committee and the um, archaeology committee. Um, I think that's pretty much it, and we will hope to bring together some of the um, work that was done today, some of the papers we've heard today. We're, we're sort of going to email all the speakers and think through some different ways of whether we want abstract, abstracts or slightly longer versions of these, or whether we work it into some kind of themed, um, themed volume um, for the 2019 volume, which is the one we're, we're aiming for. Um, and just to say thank you all for coming and there is wine outside. Can, can I just seize the moment that I'm at the front <laughs> saying thank you to Helen and Andy for an amazing conference. Yeah.